Well, we'll get right to business uh, because uh, the business of Montana is business, and many of you know that. I'd like to talk about uh, Montana's economy. And four years ago, I was elected your governor, and I pledged to you that we were going to diversify Montana's economy, and we were going to create more jobs. I remember this because four years ago, I was running for governor, and there was a fellow by the name of uh, Brown that was also running for governor. And he announced that he had an economic development plan that would create 13,000 new jobs in the course of the next four years. 13,000. They asked me, how many was I going to produce? I don't know. Couldn't tell how many, but it sure is going to be more than 13,000. I'm going to tell you this, that on January 1st, 2005, there were 401,000 people working in Montana with jobs. And at the end of August of this year, there were 460,000, that's 59,000 new jobs, the greatest number of new jobs in the shortest period of time in the history of Montana. And I want to thank every single one of you who are the engines of those jobs in every one of our cities and towns across Montana. Give yourself a round of applause. This is your work. We've been hearing about uh, how Montana compares to other places for uh, business climate. So if you go to the Business Facility 2008 state rankings, they rate Montana as the seventh best for overall business climate. Best overall tax climate for business is sixth. And of course, the Tax Foundation also just recently rated us again as sixth best uh, business taxes. Best sales tax climate, third. Quality of life, eighth. They're liars. We're one, number one. <laughs> Manufacturing momentum is ninth, most educated workforce 11th, and best education climate 19th. During the last three years, we have had the seventh fastest growing economy in America, and during the last six months, we are the third fastest growing economy in America. And according to the Tax Foundation, now, just so you know, the Tax Foundation's been in business since the 30s, and these aren't people smoking marijuana in San Francisco. This is a very conservative outfit that rates states uh, for our taxes nationwide. And they, for the second year in a row, have rated Montana sixth best in state business tax climate. We have the 10th lowest combined state and local tax burden. And we've had record low unemployment in Montana during the last four years, still some of the lowest unemployment in the country. This is state employment growth from January 2008 to July 2008. As you can see, there's only a few states that are very dark colored, and Montana has one of the highest in the nation. Just four states are 4 to 15 percent. Montana's pushing 10. We have the seventh fastest growing state for real GDP. And by the way, just, just as a side note, uh, many of you have been involved in public service for a number of years. And uh, 5, 10, 15 years uh, ago, you would look at these slides and we'd see, oh, well, we're 49th. 38th, 36th, and we knew we could do better, and we are doing better. It's been a pretty good run for Montana. Now, jobs. We're talking about those 59,000 new jobs. Uh, let's go back to the period from 1989 to 1992. Anybody remember who was governor those years? Stan Stevens, there you go. So. Every month Stan Stevens was governor from 89 to 92, um, on average, there were 802 new jobs. And from 1993 to 2000, who was governor? Mark Roscoe. Uh, there were 990 new jobs for an eight year period. And from 2001 to 2004, there was a governor, Martz, and that was 770 jobs per month. And from the period of 2005 to 2008, 1,321 new jobs per month, the greatest number in the shortest period of time in history. Wages are up. Obviously, if we have pressure on the number of jobs that we're creating in Montana, there will be upward pressure on wages, and we do. We have the third fastest growing wages in the country. We have increased the number of businesses in Montana at a record late rate from 2005 through 2007. Export growth. Go back to 1996 through 2005, stagnant export growth. In the last four years, we've increased our export growth as the fastest rate in the history of the state, and we are now the fourth fastest growing state in terms of exports. 
Value-added manufacturing. This is an area that we've had problems in Montana. I mean, during the history of Montana, we cut logs or we harvest wheat or we load cattle on a truck and we ship them someplace else to have them processed. We haven't had enough manufacturing in Montana, and now we're increasing our manufacturing rate. In fact, third fastest in the country, value of the shipments is third, and average value added per employee, we're second in the nation. Talk about oil production. This is important, energy. These are the 10 states, 10 largest producing states of oil in Montana, I mean in the United States. Uh, we'll start over here uh, with the increases. Montana has increased during the last three years We've increased our oil production by 40%, highest rate in the country. North Dakota is number two at 29%. Kansas has increased at 4%. Wyoming at 2%. Oklahoma broke even. And let's go backwards here. We've got uh, now Texas has decreased by 1%. Uh, California has decreased by 7%. New Mexico has decreased by 7%. Louisiana has decreased by 11%. And you've been hearing about the acumen of oil production in Alaska, where they have decreased by 15% during the last three years. Montana is number one in increase in oil production nationwide. Talk about coal production. I'm going to take you back to 1952. I asked you about some of these other governors, so I'm going to need somebody a little longer in the tooth to give me these answers. Who was the governor of Montana from 1952 to 1960? The Gallup and Swede, Hugo Aronson, you got that right. So there is uh, coal production. We were producing about one million ton in 1952. By 1960, we were a little less. By 1960, oh, in 1960, we elected from Sydney. Governor Nutter. Uh, Governor Nutter. Now, unfortunately, many of you know, uh, tragedy struck, and he was flying in a DC-3, and uh, the plane effectively blew up uh, outside of Helena. And then uh, his lieutenant governor, Tim Babcock, became the governor served out that term, was reelected, and Tim Babcock served until 1968. Forrest Anderson was elected, uh, served till 72, then eight years of Tom Judge, then there was Ted Schwinden, and then Stan Stevens, Mark Roscoe, Judy Marks. This is coal production in Montana. So as you can see, from 52 to 68, stagnant. From 68 to 88, the largest increase from 1 million ton to 40 million ton, and from 88 until present, <whistles> 16 years, and we ended where we started. And then, this is during the last four years. These dots represent, uh, we've increased by some 5 million ton, but these dots on top of that is the Signal Peak coal mine outside of Roundup, where the, the Boich family uh, is uh, investing $450 million building a railroad, and opening what will be the largest, most productive long-wall coal mine in America, increasing our production by 35%. This is Montana electricity generation capacity from 1975 to present. You'll see uh, in 1975, we built uh, Coal Strip 1 and 2. Coal Strip 3 and 4 were built. And then we got to 1988, and it looks like the coal chart, flat line. And this is present. A lot of that's wind energy, of course. We're increasing our wind energy at the fastest rate percentage in the country. And some of it's coal. As many of you know, the last pulverized coal plant built in America was built near Hardin. I don't know if there will be more pulverized coal plants built. I'm sure there will be more coal plants built, but I doubt that there'll be the old style pulverized coal. And the whole country seems to be waiting for Congress to act on some kind of a carbon law. When there is a carbon law in place, I think that there will be a backlog, uh, literally, of hundreds of these coal plants that will build, be built all over the country. But we need to know with certainty what will be the cost associated with producing carbon dioxide. Well, many of you are here that live in what I coined four years ago, the cowboy boot. And many of you are here are living in the areas outside the cowboy boot. And my economic development philosophy worked like something like this. If you were inside the cowboy boot, those counties that are represented from Yellowstone County through Gallatin, all the way up to the Flathead, Missoula, and Bitterroot, if we built a 14-foot fence around your counties, that cowboy boot, uh, people from all over the world would buy 16-foot ladders and they're coming anyway. You know, probably the greatest challenge you have is to decide how you will grow, not if you grow. 
and the greatest challenge you have is to create a growth policy so that your children and grandchildren will be proud of what you've done. But outside the cowboy boot, it was clear to me that we needed to find new projects, new ways to invest, and that meant to me uh, investing in uh, a balanced portfolio. We needed to invest in energy, and of course, we've developed our energy resources at the fastest rate in the history of Montana and the fastest rate in the country. We're growing tourism and the service industry, and we want to continue to create attractive communities for people to live and raise a family. The restoration economy is a very important part of Montana's economy today, and it will be for the next 30 years. Simply stated, now I'm a little biased here, but I believe that Marcus Daly um, was the copper king that was honorable. And uh, that's partly because I'm Irish and Catholic, but uh, uh, I believe that if Marcus Daly would have had one college chemistry course before he got started in this business, he probably wouldn't have destroyed Silver Bow Creek and the Clark Fork. He probably wouldn't uh, have destroyed the habitat around Anaconda and, and much of the other destruction uh, that happened in western Montana. I think if a lot of the miners that arrived in, in Montana in the early part of the century, if they'd have had some chemistry skills, they probably wouldn't have dug in the side of the mountain where there was pyrite and allowed this uh, water to flow out of the side of the mountain. There was pH 2 and 3 that was destroying our fisheries over the last 100 years. But, you know, we've been handed Montana from previous generations. Our responsibility is to see what we can do about that. Well, fortunately, we have the money to fix it. We now have about $235 million that will be placed in the restoration economy in Montana, creating thousands of jobs, people driving big yellow tractors, moving dirt around, cleaning up the mistakes of the past, and we, we get to be that generation of Montana that hands Montana along to the next generation in better condition than we found it. Better fisheries, cleaner water, better wildlife habitat, more open spaces where we can take our families for hunting, camping, and fishing, and uh, we will create thousands of jobs during the next generation. It's a win-win for all of Montana. And of course, we've been talking about energy. Uh, Montana's energy development, uh, we have tax advantages. Overall tax structure, uh, according, once again, to the Tax Foundation, finds that Montana is sixth best, North Dakota's 30th. Uh, we have the 12th lowest state and local tax burden, North Dakota's at 14th, and of course we have no general sales tax. These are energy projects all over Montana. The red ones are power plant activity at various stage of development. Uh, the light blue is wind generation activity. Uh, the yellow is the biofuels activity. And of course, in dark blue is uh, coal activity. This is zeroing in on the wind projects where you see the red dots are new and existing uh, energy, wind energy projects. And the green dots are those projects that are at various stages of development for a total of 4,000 megawatts of wind energy in Montana. Can't get it out if you don't have transmission lines. A couple years ago, Brett remembers this, we were hearing from the oil producers uh, in Richland County and Fallon County. By the way, um, am I wrong, Brett? I think almost 90% of all the oil produced in Montana comes from two counties, Fallon County and Richland County. Uh, how about just a little round of applause for those two counties that produce a lot of oil? <laughs> what we're hearing from producers uh, is, we oh, can't figure out what's going on. The market for oil, it seems cheap now, but the value of crude oil is 60 to $65 a barrel, and uh, we're offered 28 and $30 a barrel for our oil. They say we have inadequate uh, capacity in our pipelines. Well, I figured, well, there's got to be some bonuses in this. Uh, since they're only getting half as much for their oil, then we ought to be paying half as much for our gas. Oh, no, no, no. It hey, don't work that way. So we called the refiners in Billings and said, what, what's going on here? You, 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 uh, you're selling your gasoline for uh, more money than they get in Spokane. How come you're getting so much for your gasoline and our producers are only getting $28 a barrel? They said, well, we're paying $60 a barrel. So we contacted pipeline companies to say, oh, you gouging son of a... No, it's not us. We're regulated by the federal government. We only can charge so much. So I couldn't figure it out. Producers getting 28 bucks, not able to ship their oil. Refiners claiming they're paying $60 and selling the gasoline for a lot of money. So I invited 
the governor of North Dakota, the governor of Wyoming, the independent producers in eastern Montana, the pipeline companies and the refiners to all come together in a room in Billings and we said, all right, who's got the money? <laughs> well, there was a lot of finger pointing going on in the room. And as it turned out, you might imagine, it's like calling your kids together and trying to figure out what happened while you were gone. Uh, the money was going to somebody called the marketers. The marketers were the ones who buy the crude and sell the crude to the uh, refiners. And the marketers weren't in the room. But they were using the constriction in pipeline capacity to pick and choose. If you're willing to sell your oil right now for $28, we can get your oil in the pipeline. If you're not, then you can shut your well in. And so it was clear that we needed more pipeline capacity. So we started working on these pipeline companies. And, uh, and Brett, pipelines have gone in, capacity has increased, we're starting to move that oil, and those, those producers are getting much closer to West Texas crude prices. And here's some of the new pipelines that we're talking about here. This one's a big one. Uh, this is a pipeline that will actually run all the way to Fort McMurray, Alberta, and it'll run down through Montana, through these counties. By the way, those few counties in this area, if you're lucky enough to live here uh, during the next uh, years, you will have an increase of about 50 some million dollars worth of tax revenue split about five ways, five counties. Uh, and so that's a big one. It's gonna bring in a large percent of all the oil that we consume in America. I think that right now we consume about 22 million barrels total. Uh, Alberta produces about two million barrels. So they're about 10% of all of the oil that we consume in this country. And this is where it gets interesting. A lot of that oil, a large percentage of it already comes from the oil sands of Fort McMurray. And they plan to grow that oil sand investment uh, to the point where they're producing 5 million barrels, or about 23% of all the oil that we produce in America. And right now, they're piping that and plan to pipe that to the Gulf Coast. Now, you've got to think about this business plan for just a moment. Now, how does it make sense? to produce that oil in northern Alberta and pipe it all the way to Houston and New Orleans, refine it, and then put it back in a pipeline and ship it to Minneapolis or Chicago. That's what they're doing. And, and what's more, this is a different kind of oil. So the kind of oil that they have been refining in these refineries in the Gulf Coast has been the oil that they import from all over the world. 70% of our oil is imported, so they built those refineries on the coast where the crude oil arrived. They refine it there and they pipe it to the inland. That's the way the system works. But now when they switch to this Syncrude, which is a different kind of oil altogether, it costs them billions of dollars to convert their refinery. For example, the ConocoPhillips refinery uh, in Billings is converting to use 100% Syncrude from the oil sands. And it's a cool $1 billion to convert that refinery. And the Conacher refinery in Great Falls has been, uh, of course, purchased by an oil sands company, Conacher, and they've converted that refinery to use oil sands. So we think, uh, as opposed to spending seven billion and then another seven billion and another 10 billion and another 10 billion in pipeline shipping it all the way to the Gulf Coast and back, that we ought to build some refineries in Montana. Uh, we have in uh, red as the pipelines, and then in blue we have transmission lines. As we develop more electricity, in particular from wind power and hopefully from coal gasification, we have substantially more electricity than we can move out of Montana. Our limiting factor right now is transmission capacity. So uh, here is the BPA upgrade that will move more electrons to uh, the West Coast. This is Mattel. This is a brand new transmission line that will run from Great Falls to Leftbridge. This is interesting because if you look at the transmission grid in Canada, most of the electricity runs east and west in a transmission grid system. And if you look at the transmission grid system in the United States, it runs east and west as well. But currently, there's only three places where electricity crosses over the border. And uh, this will be the fourth place. And this will yield 600 megawatts of wind farms, wind farm energy. A billion dollars worth of wind farms built in the Golden Triangle because we have built this metal line. And then those wind producers can either sell that electricity into the American grid system, if we're paying the most at that particular minute, 
of that particular hour or that particular day, or they can pump it into the Canadian grid system so those wind farms will get the highest unit price at any given time. And of course, we have the Northern Lights project that we're looking at that will deliver electrons to Las Vegas. And the MISTI project is a Northwestern Energy project that they've already applied for permits that will deliver more electrons outside of Montana, ultimately to the West Coast. We talked about the refinery capacity. You know, these are some of the places that we think that would make sense to build refineries uh, for all of that new Canadian crude that's coming in. Now, we've heard questions about Montana's regulatory environment for building refineries. Uh, it's, uh, it's almost, we can all recite it. So, oh, we haven't built a refinery in America in 30 years, and it's because of regulation, and it's a lot of other things. Well, regulation might be something to do with it, but frankly, think about this for just a moment. During the last 30 years, we've uh, doubled the percentage of the oil that we import. It was some 35, 40% 30 years ago, now it's nearly 70%. And so those places where we get our crude oil, uh, you know, they have people that live in their countries too. And most of them are third world countries. So if you're a dictator in Kazakhstan or Iraq or Saudi Arabia or Iran or Angola or Nigeria or uh, Libya, and you have uh, millions of people and most of them are unemployed, does it make sense for you to have a multinational oil company come in with almost, with almost no uh, employees in your own country, drill some wells, pump that oil into a super tanker, ship the crude to New Orleans, and then employ thousands of people to refine it? Or does it make sense for you to make a deal with that multinational oil company that says, we're going to build our refinery right here, and we're going to put gasoline or diesel or aviation fuel in that tanker and ship it to the United States? Well, that's what's gone on. And if you visit, and I have, uh, with the CEO of ConocoPhillips or the CEO of Shell Oil Company or Chevron and ask them why, they'll tell you why. You say, well, it's really out of our hands. We buy the petroleum, and they own the petroleum, and they want to build their refineries, and that's what we've done. But now there's a change. We have a compelling reason to build the refineries in the United States, and that's why we're caring about our regulatory environment. We hear. I know, because I hear some of these people who are developers of projects, and they'll show up in my office and they'll say, oh, you know, we're thinking about bringing a project to Montana, but we need a, we need a few uh, tax incentives, and we want to be sure that uh, you'll change your regulatory environments, make it a little easier for us. And of course, I knew what they were going to ask for, and you know how I knew before they got there? Because they'd already been in New Mexico, and I talked to Bill Richardson two days ago, and they, then they showed up in Colorado and talked to Bill Ritter, and he said, oh yeah, they said the same thing to me, and they were... That morning, they were visiting with Dave Friedenthal, and they told him the same story. Then they got to Montana, and they'll go on up to Alberta, and they'll have the same story. So they play us against each other. How do you know whether you've got a good tax or regulatory environment? Well, we've compared. We've compared our taxes to other states and provinces in the region. We've compared our regulatory environment to other states and provinces. That's one way of doing it. But the other way of doing it is follow the money. Because they'll tell you one thing, you know, they've come to your towns before. You've had developers come there and say, oh, give me this incentive or that incentive, and if you do, we'll come to Shelby and we won't go to Conrad. Well, how do you know that you really are competitive? Well, money doesn't lie. And this is how we know we're competitive in Montana. During the last four years, there's been $1.5 billion invested in refining capacity in Montana. And in North Dakota, $125 million. And we've been hearing about South Dakota, and there's been, let's see, in South Dakota, zero. Now, these are multinational corporations. If you're ConocoPhillips and you've got businesses in 35 states, and you're doing business in 20 countries around the world, you can invest in refining capacity anywhere you choose. But when they're investing large sums of money in Montana, not in North Dakota, or not in Colorado, or not in Kazakhstan, it tells you that we have a tax and regulatory environment that is conducive for producing crude, uh, crude to uh, gasoline, aviation fuel, and diesel. This is our permitting comparison. And I was telling you, we can compare, uh, and that's what we've done here. Uh, here we have Montana. And in Montana, we have a statutory requirement. From the time that you finish your application process, we have a statutory requirement that it takes 75 days to complete that application. And uh, we've been taking about 60 days. So in blue, bobcat blue, you'll see what the statutory requirement is. 
And in grizzly colors, we show how long it actually takes. In Montana, the bobcats are beating the grizzlies. Well, at least, you know, in this particular case. In Utah, it's 90 days, and it's, uh, they're getting it done right on time. North Dakota, it's 300 days is the statutory requirement. They're getting it done about 300 days. Colorado's 125-day statutory requirement. They're getting it done in that period of time. Wyoming is also 125 days. The problem is, is it's taken them almost twice as much time to get the job done. And let me tell you why. Wyoming has uh, had a legislature that has a philosophy like our legislature has had for the last 20 years. And here's what the, the philosophy is. We don't like regulation. And so, ergo, we don't like regulators. So when the Department of Environmental Quality says um, we're requesting some dollars so that we can hire more regulators because we think that we're going to have more projects that are applying for uh, their permits, uh, they have said no. Because we don't like regulations, so we don't like regulators, so you get less money. And so then when you increase the number of projects that you have, what happens is you delay the number of days that it takes for the project to get their permits. And in Wyoming, they've had a similar philosophy, only it's ended more badly than it has here in Montana, and it's taking them twice as long of their statutory requirements to get those done. Now, we have asked the legislature for something. In 2005, they said, no, we're not going to give you that money. 2007, we thought about it. We said, okay, well, we'll anticipate what they'll say. So we actually had a backup plan. We said, all right, we understand you don't like regulators. We understand you don't like regulation. How about we do this? You just give us the statutory authority so that if somebody wants to permit a project, that they can come to the Department of Environmental Quality. The Department of Environmental Quality will tell them about how much it's going to cost to do this study. The Department of Environmental Quality will collect the money from the private company and then contract a second separate company to do the regulation permits. So they are the ones who actually look at the permitting processes and make recommendations to the Department of Environmental Quality. Let's do that. And then that way, there's no discussion, will we have this number of projects we're anticipating or not? We'll hire them as we need them. We didn't get the statutory authority, but we're going to try again. We're going to try again. I think it's a good idea. And so we don't get ourselves in a pickle. Let's talk about education for just a little bit. And the reason I'm going to talk about it is because um, your ability to attract businesses to come to your towns is directly proportional to the education system that you have in your town. And I know that because I've been visiting with companies uh, all over the country, some who have already decided to come to Montana, some who are getting ready to decide to come to Montana, we hope. And uh, they already know our tax and regulatory environment. They can look at all the national studies. They're talking to folks. But what they want to know is, are we going to invest in a job training system? Are we going to invest in the workforce that we have in Montana to retrain them for the kinds of jobs that they have? And the second question they have is this. If I'm going to bring 30 of my employees who are engineers and scientists and business people who are well-educated people from all over the country, if I'm going to bring them to Montana, will you make the commitment to me that you have a very good K-12 education system? Because they're not coming unless you have a world-class K-12 education system. And so I'd like to be able to say to them that we do. Now, here's what I'm going to show you. This is K-12 state funding per A and B. A and B is what they uh, in Helena call students. That is average number belonging. That is the amount of money that the legislature sends to every school in Montana based on the number of students that they have. And if you follow this graph, you'll see that in 1992, the legislature decided we were going to send about $3,000 per student to every school district in Montana. And something happened in 1992, and there was a change in philosophy, and then we started decreasing the amount that we spent in K-12, and it took us all the way to the year 2000 to get back to where we started. Now, if you've got fewer dollars or the same dollars eight years from now as you had today, uh, this is not inflation adjusted, by the way. It just means that you've got fewer resources to educate the same number of students, right? That's what it means. And so I'm going to give uh, Judy March some kudos here. Uh, these were her four budgets. This, uh, excuse me, two budgets, but those are the four years that Judy March was the governor, and she actually increased it um, some $350. And then this is the, the last four years. This is the largest increase in K-12 education funding in the shortest period of time in the history of Montana. 
we increased it uh, from $3,500 to more than $4,500 per student. Uh, by the way, these years, these years created a system whereby the state of Montana uh, became the defendants in a lawsuit because the people said that we're violating our constitutional oath, which is to adequately and equally fund K-12 education. Well, this is higher education, which is as important and some might consider more important when you're recruiting businesses to Montana because they want to know, do you have the resources to retrain adults for these emerging jobs? If we're coming to Shelby, Larry, and they want to bring 30, they want to recruit 30 people to build widgets in Shelby, um, how many widgeteers do you have in Shelby right now? Now you see how he gets all the business. <laughs> they need to be trained. And we will retrain adults. And that's why we need higher education. Let me show you again. This is going back to 1992. We were investing $5,500 per Montana University student. The legislature was sending to our universities $5,500 for every enrolled Montana University student. And then in 1995, we dropped it down to less than $4,500. And we stayed low until we got to 2005. Remember, I, uh, I threw some kudos to Judy Marks because she got the ball rolling and increasing the funding for K-12. Uh, I'm not going to say the same about higher education because she, uh, she matched Mark Roscoe's performance. And now this is the increase in university education, college of technology, community colleges, tribal colleges, and university systems during the last four years. And uh, this is why. Hey, look at this. This is Montana's wage increase on the bottom line. We increased wages at 2 to 3.5%, and cost of tuition increases have been two to three times the rate of our ability to pay. This red bar back here in 1991, that represents the difference between a Montana family's ability to pay for college and the cost of college. Now, this is today. This red line, that represents... How do, you, how do you make the difference if you don't have the money to send your kid to college? That red line represents loans. And so we are now in a position where we're forcing our students to take on 15, 20, 30, $35,000 worth of loans. And that's why I proposed to the legislature, and we passed in the last legislative session, something called the College Affordability Plan, which simply stated was enough money so that the universities did not increase tuition for the first time in 30 years and we've passed uh, what we call the best and brightest scholarship program so that middle class families all over Montana, uh, a few thousand now, have uh, college scholarships to go to Montana colleges. Why are we investing? This is 1950 on your left. In 1950, 60 percent of the jobs in America were for unskilled labor, 20 percent for were skilled, and 20 percent were professional. Professional represents dentists, doctors, lawyers, accountants, uh, skilled labor, uh, folks that, that have uh, heating and air conditioning skills, they're, they're plumbers, they're pipe fitters, they're electricians, and unskilled are people that have strong backs. Today, we have only 15% of our jobs for unskilled labor, 60% are for skilled labor, labor, and still the same number of professionals. Our colleges of technology, our universities, our tribal colleges, our community colleges convert unskilled labor to skilled labor, simply stated. And these are our colleges all across Montana. But we've got a different vision. Here's the vision. I'm going to tell you, these are places of education. These are physical places of education. But the world of education has changed. Education place is more a state of mind now than it is a physical location. Wherever you are, if you have access to broadband computer uh, capabilities, then you can access distance learning. They're doing it all over the world. And I've challenged our Board of Regents, our university system, to increase the number of classes that they offer with distance learning. And we've challenged our high schools and our teachers and the unions. We've said to them, look, if you have a high school junior who would like to take a university course from Montana State University, let's say they want to take advanced calculus, why won't you allow them to take advanced calculus from Montana State University and use that course as one of their math courses they need to graduate from high school, and they will also start accumulating college credits when they get to college? Why wouldn't you do that? 
Oh, there were all kinds of reasons why they didn't want to do that. And on the university side, there were all kinds of reasons why they didn't want to get involved in distance learning because they were still of the philosophy that education is a physical place. And if you travel the world, have a look around, um, raise your hand if you've taken any online courses. Okay. Um, what we're trying to do is to create a virtual education system in Montana so that if you go to a Class C school like I did, you could take Mandarin or Arabic, you could take advanced biology, and we want to give the tools to our high school teachers so that they can educate every single child at their own God-given ability. Because if you are a parent or if you're a teacher, you walk into a classroom and there's 20 kids in that class, and God didn't make them the same. And there's something like a bell-shaped curve, and some kids are on the left side of the bell-shaped curve, and they're barely figured out what the teacher's talking about. And on the right side of the bell-shaped curve, they should be taking an advanced course right now, and they're bored. But if you had the tools of distance learning in your classroom, you could challenge the kids, the three or four on the left side of the bell-shaped curve in one way, and the four or five on the right side of the bell-shaped curve in another way, and the kids in the middle, you could challenge them in a, in a separate way. Every child is uh, challenged at their own level, and it costs less money with distance learning than it does in the present system. Teachers still have their jobs. They're just able to educate at a higher level. They are just able to give more tools at a faster rate, and that's why we want to make education a state of mind in Montana, not necessarily a place. We're investing in state invest the state investment in worker training. Uh, the, through the Department of Commerce, we have $4 million that we're using to retrain people so that when companies come to Montana, we're able to say to them, we can spend more money to retrain the people that you bring to Montana or the ones you hire in Montana than they do in Colorado or they do in New Mexico or they do in North Dakota. And so all sum total, we have about $13.5 million worth of these worker training programs. It's a great tool for all of you to be using if you want to recruit businesses. Now we want to talk about taxes a little bit. We all agree we don't like taxes. Nobody likes taxes, right? But you actually have to balance budgets. You don't get to print your own money. Maybe if you're in Sydney and you've got more oil coming in, it's almost like printing money. But I want to talk very serious with you about the ideas that we've heard about business equipment tax. Now, I have proposed in the last two legislative sessions that we eliminate the business equipment tax for 90% of the businesses in Montana. If you have $150,000 worth of taxable business equipment, we would eliminate your business equipment tax and we would make you the local government's whole because of these uh, business equipment taxes, 50% go directly to the schools, 25% go to the counties and cities, and 25% goes to the state. So when you eliminate the business equipment tax, uh, any percentage of it, it means your revenues go down, right? You've, uh, this ain't your first rodeo. You've watched this thing happen before. But as part of our proposal, we've proposed to make you whole. And the way we would make you whole is we have proposed that we would close the loopholes for people that don't live in Montana who actually owe income tax in Montana that are not paying it. Now, a lot of these folks are minerals owners. They own minerals in Montana, but they live someplace else. And let me tell you how the loophole works. As you know, we have split estates in Montana. Simply stated, you can own the surface rights, but not the mineral rights. Or you can own the mineral rights and not the surface rights. Or you could own a little of both. Bottom line is, if you're from Omaha, Nebraska, and for some reason you acquired mineral rights in Montana, you inherited them, or you bought them, or somebody uh, sold them to you, whatever it is, you own mineral rights, and uh, right now we have a big boom going on all across Montana, people leasing up these mineral rights. And somebody calls you and says, we understand you have 10,000 acres of mineral rights in Petroleum County and Township X and Y and Z in these sections. And what we would like to do and propose to you is we'd like to lease those 10,000 acres and we'll pay you $10 uh, lease payment. We'll pay you $100,000 to have the right to develop that oil during the next 10 years. They say, uh, no, I don't want to do it. I want 15. All right, fine, we'll pay 150,000. They write them a check for $150,000. It goes right to Omaha, Nebraska. And do you think, what percent of those people do you think are sending any money back to the state of Montana as their tax? What percent? Take a guess. 
close to zero, 1%. All right, how about when they actually find oil and they distribute the oil to the various folks? We do a little better because there's a little better tracking there. We get almost to 3%. So what we've proposed is to close that loophole so that they pay the same taxes as if they lived in Montana. And that money, in closing those loopholes, would be more than enough to make you whole if we eliminated the business equipment tax up to $150,000. Now let's go with the last 10% of business equipment tax. Let's talk about, uh, what community would we talk about? Let's, Yellowstone County? Who's from Billings here? Anybody? Well, you know what I found in Billings? is you've got six, six entities in Yellowstone County, just six, that pay $29 million in business equipment tax. I can go through the whole number with you, but $29 million is what those six entities, you probably have an idea, do I need to say? You know who they are. And so that's $29 million. So if you eliminated that $29 million, 50% uh, comes right out of the schools, so $14 million or so. And uh, what is it, uh, five, six million, something like that, a little more, comes out of the city and county. And uh, then we hear people say, well, we'll make you whole. Somehow the state of Montana will have more money and we'll send that money out to you. Has that happened before when they cut your tax revenues? I don't think we've got the money, frankly, because remember the state of Montana was getting 25% too and we are eliminating that 25%. So every buck you lose, we lose. So where's that money going to come to make you whole? I think it's a bad idea. I would like to stick with where we're at. We'll eliminate the business equipment tax up to $150,000 and we'll promise you we'll make you whole because as part of that bill, we will be assuring you that we'll have the resources from these out-of-state mineral owners to make you whole. And that's pretty clear. That's the way I see it. Uh, and we want to keep Montana moving. These are just some of the counties. See whether I was right or wrong. Silver Bow County, uh, just a single company. Uh, the loss to schools, uh, that's just one company is $606,000 a year in Cascade County. Uh, PP&L, Quest, Northwestern, to a total of 4.2 million. Missoula County, 5.6 million from three companies. Lewis and Clark, there's 4.8 million from two companies. Gallatin is uh, 4.8, Yellowstone County, well, you can add them up. So there's a lot, uh, Flathead County, 2.8 million, Ravalli County, 6.4. Now remember, I'm just picking a couple of the top ones. This isn't everybody. This is just a few of the top ones and what it would mean to your uh, local tax base. Rosebud, Bighorn, Sweetgrass, Wheatland. Bottom line, folks, during the last four years, we've increased energy production in Montana at the fastest rate in the history of Montana. We've increased the number of jobs in Montana at the fastest rate in the history of Montana. We've cut more taxes for more families in Montana than any time in history. And if you read the paper today, you know that we have nearly a $1 billion budget surplus. Now, I'm not so sure it's going to be as good as they say because, you know, there's an international contagion going on and it may be a little less than a billion. But it means that our economy is still good. And, and by the way, when you get back home, talk to your bankers um, and let them know that you're hearing and you're going to tell folks that the banking business in Montana is solid. Uh, I've had an opinion about bankers in Montana because I've been in business here for about 30 years. I've always thought of them as, uh, let's see it fondly though, as tight-fisted SOBs. <laughs> well, no, no I, I say that because, uh, you know, my experience with Montana bankers is you could walk in and you could show them your business plan and you could show them, well, look, I'm going to buy this many bread heifers. I already have the hay. I've already got the grass. I've already got the waters and the, the water and corral and I can forward contract the calves for X amount. And uh, unless, unless there's a, you know, a volcano and they all blow up, um, we're going to be able to pay you back. And they say, oh, looks tough. So ultimately, what Montana bankers say, here's what we're going to, we're just going to be honest with you. If you got $3 in your left pocket, we'll loan you $1 in your right pocket. Now, I cussed them for a lot of years, but as it turned out, that was just good banking policy, and they were doing what Main Street bankers do, because Main Street bankers, uh, they're not dependent on Wall Street for their money. They depend on depositors, and then they loan that money to other people in their community, and they're able to pay their depositors back when those people pay their money back. So they gotta be tight because they go to church with the people they loan money to and they go to church with people that they are collecting the money from. So they've done their job and I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm hearing from bankers and I've been visiting with them because this is, you know, interesting times. 
that they've never been stronger than they are right now, and they are a reflection of Montana's economy. And Montana's economy is pretty good. Uh, the next legislative session, you can expect more of the same. We're going to invest more money in K-12. We're going to invest more money in higher education. We're going to continue to grow energy investments in Montana, and we're going to continue to find ways of sending more money back to each one of you as homeowners. And one more thing, just like I did in the last legislative session, if the legislature tries to spend more money than I'm willing to spend, I'll start vetoing bills. I vetoed 19 bills last time. About half of them were Democrats, about half of them were Republicans, because I told them, when you leave, I want $180 million in the bank. I want a budget surplus because my grandpa told me this a long time ago. He said, Brian, never forget, never forget that in Montana we have three bad years for every good year. Be prepared. And we've just had four extraordinary years. And so by grandpa's estimations, remember, he made it through the Great Depression, though, here in Montana. He says, well, there's some bad years coming. So I am going to assure you right now that in the next legislative session, I'm not going to let the legislature spend all the money. I'll continue to veto bills until we have an adequate surplus. Uh, I think there's 45 states right now are in budget deficit. Uh, Arnie Schwarzenegger just wrote a letter to the president, said that California wants to borrow $7 billion. And I was thinking, I was thinking, since we have an extra billion, I might call Arnie. <laughs> and say, Arnie, and by the way, uh, you know, when we go to governor's meetings, you know, since uh, we spell our names almost the same, we sit next to each other. So I say, Artie, I got a proposition for you. I understand you need, we don't have seven bill, but we can do a bill. And uh, well, we'll need 14% interest. <laughs> and you need to pay monthly. If you miss two months, well, we got some people that come down there and, you know. <laughs> oh, and, and by the way, we want to secure it with San Diego because Montana's always wanted a warm water port. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. See you now.